Hello all, uh, my name is Carl Fitzgerald. I am uh, Michael Hudson's webmaster and uh, have uh, interviewed Michael many times on my Renegade Economist podcast. So uh, welcome to our quarterly Q&A session here with uh, our friend Michael Huck Hudson. Michael, um, I wanted to start off today with uh, the end of the first half of the year, the S&P down 20%. Where to from here, do you think? Everybody says it's going to go further. Uh, there's no reason for it to go up. Uh, the, we're in the middle of a debt deflation. Everybody's talking about uh, the prices going up by 8%, 10%, uh, 12%, uh, the measures differ. But uh, we should remember that while all of this is occurring, most of the wage earners in America are being squeezed. They're, being sque they're further and further into debt than they were ever before. Uh, ever since 2008, the debt's been going up. The rents are soaring in the United States. Rents are up 20%. And uh, a very interesting thing I was discussing with uh, uh, friends, of, economists, friends of mine today, uh, how do you really measure what people are having to pay for housing? Uh, it, according to the Bank of England statistics, housing prices are not going up in England. But what's happened is that the only way that people can keep affordable housing in England is to move one or two hours outside of England, and you have to pay a couple of hundred uh, pounds to get a uh, rail pass uh, for the month. So if you add the price of transport to housing, I think that's a much better uh, measure of how the price of uh, housing has actually gone up. And uh, when people have to pay more for debt service, for housing, or in America for medical care, they have less money to spend on goods and services. And that means uh, mainly goods. Um, and that means that corporations who produce goods or market them, even if the goods are produced in China, uh, they have to sell them at a profit, but people are having to cut back their budgets in the United States, in Britain, uh, and in fact, in Europe, now that their electric bills are going up hundreds of dollars uh, a week, people are having much less money to spend on uh, things that are discretionary, as economists say. They have uh, less to spend on clothing, on luxuries, on uh, uh, little extras, uh, whether it's for food or eating out or uh, clothes or whatever people uh, uh, spend on. So that means that if there are fewer sales, uh, profits are going to be down and unless uh, the economy is run by monopolies. And uh, they simply increase the price to uh, stabilize their income. That's what electric utilities do. Uh, under the law in the United States, if electric usage goes down, the utilities are allowed to raise their rates so that they can stabilize their income enough so that they can pay the bondholders and the banks uh, for the money uh, that are lent. So uh, uh, all of these uh, built-in so-called stabilizers are to stabilize the wealth of the 1% at the expense of the 99%. Uh, and uh, any talk of uh, recovery means recovery of the 1%, not, uh, uh, not the 99%. But the fact is that now the 1% is suffering uh, almost uh, as heavily as uh, the 99%. But of course, you know, who, although 10% uh, of, of the American population owns 72% of the stocks, but a lot of stocks are also held by pension funds. And the pension funds all of a sudden have found the amount of money that they have way uh, down and they're way below, they're underfunded. They don't have the money to pay the pensions to uh, their workers uh, when they retire. So this is going to be a real problem uh, mounting up. Uh, and uh, uh, it may, uh, public uh, revenues are down, local revenues uh, uh, are down uh, without getting uh, taxes on capital gains, lower, lower, uh, low as these taxes are, uh, the uh, the government's tax take is falling. So everything is shrinkage, and uh, that's the. Uh, President Biden here calls this uh, the Putin inflation, but it's the Biden inflation. It was Biden's choice uh, to. Uh, uh, expand to go to war, uh, a proxy war uh, in Ukraine, and to impose uh, the sanctions on Russia. Uh, and the sanctions on Russia really are 
sanctions to prevent uh, the world from buying oil or food from anyone other than American oil companies and their partners and American agriculture. The sanctions really should be looked at as a buy American policy and the Americans are making a killing as uh, oil prices go up. Uh, the, the only, uh, uh, you mentioned the stock market going down, oil company prices way up. Uh, for all of this, uh, the same th uh, uh, in agriculture, although agriculture prices are up, the farmers are actually getting less and less. All of the profit is taken by the intermediaries, by uh, Archer, uh, Daniels, uh, 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 and uh, uh, the, the, uh, co uh, the, the other uh, firms. And while that's happening, uh, the price of fertilizers going up, uh, the farmers are going bankrupt uh, throughout the United States. So uh, this is great news if you're a billionaire. Uh, the largest landowner now is uh, Microsoft's uh, head, and uh, uh, he's been buying up uh, farmland all over the United States, thinking that uh, uh, he'll end up like uh, the old uh, feudal landlords in uh, 14th century Britain. Michael, um, back to inflation, uh, Matt Stoller had an interesting piece talking about how it wasn't wage price driven, this inflation rate, it was mon monopoly rent pro profit uh, inflation driven. So uh, where do you sit on that? It sort of seems to fit into your, your hypothesis there. He's absolutely right. It, uh, he, uh, Matt Stoller uh, uh, always uh, emphasizes uh, the role of monopoly and uh, the government's uh, failure to enforce the anti-monopoly laws that were put on the books way back in the 1890s with the Sherman Antitrust uh, Law. And uh, the uh, when you think about it, Industrial capitalism during its takeoff in the United States, uh, the one thing that uh, industrial capitalism tried to do that was progressive and revolutionary was to get rid of what was called economic rent, not only land rent, but monopoly rent. And the purpose of uh, uh, it was the industrialists uh, that wanted to uh, prevent monopolies from taking place because monopolies would simply raise the price of what people needed to live on. And that meant that the uh, manufacturing companies would have to pay higher and higher wages to afford the monopoly uh, prices that uh, labor had to pay. So the interest of industry was uh, to keep down monopoly rent just as they wanted to keep down uh, economic rent. And of course it was the banks uh, that were the mother of trusts. That's what they were called. It was the banks that sought to organize uh, steel, copper and other uh, uh, sectors uh, into trusts. And uh, that's been uh, the fight of the United States for the last 130 years. Uh, and uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans have joined together to uh, get rid of uh, um, uh, monopoly uh, reg uh, regulation so that uh, we can become a rentier economy once again, like we were back in the good old feudal times. Well, let's hope we get some good data together on how much these monopoly rents are adding to inflation. They typically always downgrade them in the basket of goods. But um, lots of good questions coming through from uh, our Patreon supporters here. Um, what about uh, China and their Belt and Road uh, program? Is that adding to inflation in that part of the world? What does the W o Robert, Robert Hall asked that one. What is the, the Chinese no. Belt and Road Program. Oh, oh no, of course not. How on earth could that be doing it? Uh, it's, it's, it uh, when you build more transportation, you make the distribution costs low. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, uh, the uh, Chinese in Hong Kong needed to buy uh, 50 copies of uh, uh, my new book, the, uh, uh, the Destiny of Civilization. They're printed in India. And uh, the cost of transportation from India to China of 50 copies of the book was larger than the cost of actually printing them in China. So uh, anything that you can do to lower the cost of transportation uh, is going to lower the final price that people, people pay. Uh, in the United States, the farmers are squeezed by the cost of transportation. There's a wonderful novel about uh, uh, how the railroads uh, ended up uh, getting most of the farm income in the early 20th century. It's Frank Norris's novel, The Octopus. Uh, and it's just wonderful for an example of railroads uh, getting uh, uh, all of the land rent uh, 
uh, as in the form of monopoly rent by uh, controlling by the price of transportation so that uh, if uh, grain prices or crop prices go up, uh, the railroads will just charge the farmers more. So the profits don't, the farmers don't get any benefit from the price rise. The railroads get it all. Well, that's what happens uh, uh, for transportation uh, in the world. Uh, the, uh, what would be inflationary is uh, uh, President Biden and NATO's promise that they can uh, 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 cr spread the world of Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair all over uh, Europe uh, and uh, South America and the global South by a private public initiative uh, that will uh, make uh, roads and uh, all other forms of transportation uh, into monopolies that uh, they say will be very, very lucrative and can uh, help make the 1% uh, just as rich as it was before, if only the rest of the world will let uh, 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 transportation and public utilities be uh, monopolized and financialized instead of provided by government. Good. I can see you getting fired up there, Michael. <laughs> Always like that. Um, we've got uh, Carl Sanchez, um, one of our uh, um, active Regular. Patreons. Carl, you had a question? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, actually. But we'll yeah. go ahead and start off with uh, just an observation that the prairie populace gave us a really good template as to uh, what we can do with regards to the money power and all that back in the end of the 19th century. But what can we do and from learning from them to deal with uh, the same sort of money power we have to deal with in the beginning of the 21st century here? Wait, you're saying who? It sounded like you said Heliogabalus. He was a Roman Empire. Maybe the <laughs> sound that. no, the uh, the the prairie populace. Oh, back the prairie populace. Okay, credit. Try, try to say latter... that past three times in a row. It's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> right. They provided us with an excellent template about how, yes. how to organize and what to do against what they call the money power yes. in the late 19th century. Well, now oh. they're all for the money power. Uh, they vote straight Republican, uh, and uh, the prairie populists have uh, one basic uh, desire. They want less income and higher prices. That's what they vote for, and that's their choice. So uh, they're va basically voting to go out of business and uh, have their children move to the big city. That's so what they we don't did have the a prairie populist sense. movement today. <laughs> Okay, Carl, well, one, now, one, other, one other thing I'd like to ask, and I know you said a while back in one of your essays that we needed to have a big political fight in order to go ahead and get anything done. So how do we organize this big political fight, given that uh, there really isn't any access to national politics at the grassroots level? I have a great solution to that. Uh, I've gone to China. Uh, basically, I work where uh, uh, the fight can have a result. Uh, what's the point of having, I don't see any way of having a fight in the United States. Uh, it, it, there's no way that one can, uh, you, you saw what happened to Bernie Sanders uh, with the party. Uh, I don't think there can be any political fight in the United States until you uh, get, uh, dissolve the Democratic Party. I think uh, basically, suppose you had only the Republican Party, awful as it is. If you had a Republican Party, you'd have what the Constitution originally wanted, basically one party without factionalism, and people would have to run uh, uh, just uh, against each other, just a single party election. Uh, what's, really dis what's really paralyzed the political fight in the United States is the fact that you have two parties saying exactly the same thing that sort of prevent, and these two parties uh, have blocked any kind of a third party from uh, really uh, uh, getting on the ballot, and they blocked any uh, progressive uh, from getting on the ballot. And uh, I, I don't see any political way of making progress here uh, unless you would uh, replace the Constitution with something like uh, the European uh, uh, parliamentary system, where uh, uh, you can have any number of different parties and uh, there's not the two party uh, duopoly here. A two party duopoly means, in effect, uh, a constant re uh, Republican party, because the job of the Democrats is to make sure that uh, there's no criticism of the Republican Party from the left. 
Uh, and as long as uh, that's the characteristic of the American system, I don't believe it's reformable. So uh, I don't see any fight taking place. Why fight? Why get in a fight? You're just going to lose and that's going to waste your time. Uh, I find uh, talking to China uh, and talking to other countries, uh, uh, there's much more flexibility there. It's, uh, they are creating a new world order. They're creating an alternative uh, to the US NATO, an alternative to neoliberalism. And uh, I don't think that you can reform neoliberalism. I don't think you can reform American politics, uh, but you can help shape uh, the, uh, the, uh, out, the new uh, order uh, stemming from uh, Russia, Iran, uh, China, uh, the, uh, India, uh, the BRICS. Uh, is, uh, is being un developed almost every uh, uh, week, week by week. Uh, you're seeing an alternative to the World Bank, an alternative to the IMF, an alternative to the World Court. Uh, you're seeing the world being reshaped. Uh, I don't see the world being reshaped in uh, America and Europe. Mm. Look, uh, let's um, move on. You know, great questions, Carl. Always uh, uh, Ben Zhao has a few questions there. Um, ben, uh, are you online? Uh, yeah, I'm here. And um, so I, I have a couple questions. They're kind of multi-part and related. And it re regards um, why it seems like none of the major global powers are doing things um, to in its own best interest. So uh, first, you know, because of the Ukraine conflict, for example, um, why does Russia continue to sell gas in euros when it can't spend the euros? Um, and particularly, uh, in particular, what do you think about the Russian um, central bank policies, uh, and particularly Nabulina? And why does Russia need to issue bonds at eight percent interest uh, when it can't, you know, and not use its own reserves that are placed in in foreign bonds? Um, likewise, you know, why is China keeping such a large um, trade deficit with the United States when essentially it's getting, um, you know, trillions or billions of dollars of paper? that it is losing money on due to inflation and uh, which the, U the USA can renege or sanction um, in response to, to Russia. And then lastly, even, you know, why is, is the United I'll, States I'll, position? I, I'll forget all of your questions. If you keep piling them on, I'm just gonna forget them. Uh, my, my brain is limited uh, for this. Uh, I, I'm sure Russia must be doing something with the rubles it's getting. Uh, my suspicion is it's, sell, it's uh, converting them into uh, other currencies, or maybe it's buying gold. Uh, if you look at Russia's reserves uh, and China's reserves, they're actually ha having fewer and fewer dollars. They're, they're de-dollarizing uh, every single month. Uh, and you can look in the statistics, uh, fewer dollars. So uh, the, uh, they're doing what uh, you think they should do less dollars. They're increasing their gold. They're increasing each other's currencies uh, for all of this. So uh, they're certainly not holding these euros in Europe, otherwise they'd be grabbed. Uh, they're doing something with them uh, to get out of euros. They're not uh, continuing uh, to hold them. So it's just a, a means of payment. Uh, the central bank very uh, uh, basically is run by uh, a, a neoliberal uh, who simply tried to stabilize the uh, exchange rate in uh, traditional ways. And the way when there was uh, the sanctions and when America grabbed uh, $300 billion of Russia's foreign reserves, uh, the central bank had raised temporarily the interest rate to 20%. And that meant this is just for uh, uh, overnight, this is an annualized rate, but only paid for a couple of weeks uh, and uh, maybe a, a week or two, and then the ruble strengthened. So it was simply to prevent the ruble from being driven way down to enable speculators uh, to make uh, a huge gain. So uh, the uh, interest rate is going right down, uh, way down now. Russia has very little foreign debt. I think 15% of, uh, uh, of its GDP is government debt. Russia has less government debt than any other uh, country uh, because it, it doesn't need 
uh, any uh, uh, debt. It can print its own money uh, and it doesn't need to borrow uh, from foreigners uh, at all, except uh, uh, what central banks do, which is uh, m- m- maneuver in the foreign exchange uh, market just to stabilize things instead of having them go up and down. So Russia has been doing a pretty uh, sort of standardized, uh, normal uh uh, stability program on on that. It's not uh, it's not being suckered. Um, okay, so I, I guess a, a quick follow up to that. You know, currently Russian imports are down by something like eighty eight percent, and um, they're really prohibited from using uh, U.S. dollars. And and so, like, at what point do you, you know, it it just kind of boggles my mind that it seems like we're in a proxy conflict, but there's still feeding the the other party with energy uh, while while China's essentially doing the same thing with um, with labor um, and it, it just seems like uh, I, I, I don't really know when they'll are they waking up to that kind of uh, fact on the ground or is that going to continue and for the first well the sanctions really aren't cutting very much uh, suppose you're in Russia and you say gee uh, I'd like a coca-cola uh, there's plenty of Coca-Cola. You can there's Fanta there, uh, but they they all have Kurgis uh, 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 wrappings, uh, and Coca-Cola is written in uh, they it's bought in Kyrgyzstan, uh, and the title Coca-Cola is written in in Kyrgyz, uh, because uh, Kyrgyz can trap trade with the United States. Uh, somehow, uh, Russia is able to sell uh, as much oil as usual. Uh, it is selling it at a discount to India. Uh, and India uh, exports. Uh, so Russia's oil is exported b- via India and by other uh, countries instead of uh, by Russia itself, as long as it wants to do that. Uh, what it's really cut back on is gas because uh, the Germans uh, na- uh, nationalized or grabbed uh, Gazprom's uh, uh, distribution uh, facilities uh, and is not willing to pay uh, in rubles. So uh, the uh, the Europeans are not getting getting gas, but just about every and uh, Russia is not exporting helium, uh, which is used in uh, making computer chips, and it's uh, uh, it it is still exporting titanium. And uh, German steel companies are buying uh, Russian titanium uh, just to stock up so they can continue to make uh, titanium steel. So really, a lot of this is uh, the sanctions are just uh, plain charade. What what America really doesn't want is for uh, the global South countries to buy uh, oil and gas and uh, food. Uh, It's trying to put the squeeze on them for uh, the kind of power grab that uh, the Biden administration has just pulled on uh, the NATO NATO countries in Europe. Michael, Jake Staniels asked a good question in the Q&A chat. Um, some comparisons have been made between our current situation and the 73 oil crisis uh, and the Volcker shock. Do you agree? No, the oil crisis, first of all, it wasn't an oil crisis. It was a grain crisis. Um, uh, President Carter uh, thought that he would increase uh, American power by quadrupling the price of grain uh, that he he maneuvered uh, by a number of uh, 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 policies. Uh, OPEC retaliated by saying, if you're going to quadruple the price of grain, we will quadruple the price of oil. Uh, I was a part of this discussion. I was going back and forth to the White House and the Treasury uh, quite a bit with uh, Herman Kahn, uh, and we were in the middle of uh, strategizing uh, over all of this. Uh, the uh, the Treasury of, uh, Secretary told uh, Saudi Arabia that it would be an act of war, that they could charge whatever they wanted for the oil. It's okay uh, quadrupling the price of oil. Uh, he came from Exxon. Uh, and. Uh, this uh, uh, basically a quadrupling the price of oil made a huge profit for Exxon, for uh, Sekonia Mobil, for Conoco, for all the oil firms. And uh, uh, Saudi Arabia was told you can charge as much as you want, but all of the profits you have to recycle into the United States, either in by buying treasury bonds or by buying stocks uh, and bonds, but you can't buy anything important. You can't buy any important American industry. You can do what the Japanese do, and you can buy Rockefeller Center and lose a billion dollars on it uh, because you didn't uh, uh, know that the the land was separate from the building. 
uh, or you can buy a golf course and lose a billion dollars on it, but you can't buy any uh, important American company. Uh, you just have to help uh, uh, create a stock market boom. Uh, the money really isn't going to be yours. You can make as much as you want, but you have to spend it here. Well, nothing like that is occurring uh, with Russia. Uh, the United States cannot tell Russia, well, you're making a killing in the, uh, uh, in the oil and gas market, but you have to send it all to the United States so that we can grab it all. Uh, Russia has no in, uh, intention of uh, investing in the United States or buying U.S. stocks. Uh, it's going to use uh, the, the export proceeds to uh, build up its own industry. And uh, President Putin has said he's going to concentrate on import displacing industries. He's going to uh, use the money he gets to uh, uh, replace uh, the type of commodities that Russia has been buying from the United States and Europe uh, to become independent. So uh, that's uh, it's, uh, the uh, inverse image of what happened in 1973 and four. Wow, never heard that take on, on the oil crisis and stagflation. Oh, you're uh, too young, Carl, you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have heard a land related story on it, but um, not that one. So uh, let's move on to um, more questions in the Q&A, keep them coming through. Tim um, asked, Naked Capitalism posted an article from INET a few days ago, basically saying that an alternative international reserve currency is very difficult because no country would be willing to run a huge deficit. Can you elaborate more on this from an MMT perspective? And the purpose of an international currency isn't to uh, enable countries to finance their own industry. An international currency is, what do you do if you're running a balance of payment surplus? How, do you, how are you able to hold this in the form of, of savings? Uh, an international currency uh, also is a, supply, a way of financing deficit countries. Suppose you're a Latin American country and, uh, uh, or an African country. Well, this summer, they're going to be uh, paying much more for their oil. Uh, they're going to be paying much more for their food. And because the Federal Reserve has raised its interest rates, they're going to have to pay, uh, the, uh, the dollar is going way, way up. It's gone up maybe 20% against the South African currency, the Brazilian currency, uh, the, uh, the South, uh, global South currencies uh, now have to uh, use much more of their export proceeds, much more of their domestic currency to pay the dollar debts. Well, the idea is how do you have uh, in, uh, uh, a means of denominating the foreign debts that are run up by deficit countries uh, to pay the surplus countries uh, without uh, going bankrupt? Well, an international bank would do a number of things. Uh, what President Putin has uh, said is that Russia is going to have uh, a different kind of an international bank uh, than the International Monetary Fund. First of all, uh, there can be an arrangement of uh, uh, third, uh, Global South countries and uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries paying in their own currencies with swaps. Suppose every a member of this uh, uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, a BRICS, uh, BRICS bank uh, will put up a billion dollars of their own currency uh, for people to draw on. Well, that will be one way that you can settle deficits. Uh, the other way is uh, you can use gold or something like that, but the international bank can create something like uh, IMF special drawing rights, but instead of being uh, issued to finance American military spending abroad, it'll be issued to finance uh, trade uh, with uh, countries that are temporarily in deficit, uh, or they'll be like uh, Keynes's Bancor uh, that he suggested in uh, 1944, uh, that it will be uh, uh, created to help uh, finance uh, structural deficits until countries can begin to uh, stop uh, focusing on export plantation crops and can begin to feed themselves so that they don't have to face the huge uh, grain deficits and food deficits uh, to the United States that the World Bank has uh, insisted that uh, uh, they distort themselves uh, to run. Uh, the, central, uh, the central objective of the World Bank since its founding is to make sure that other countries do not feed themselves uh, and to uh, only make loans for the export sector so that they can grow plantation crops uh, and uh, uh, 
will not uh, spend domestic currency at home to uh, help uh, modernize their family-owned uh, agriculture and domestic uh, food production. So uh, the, uh, the, the Russian bank will be nothing like uh, the predatory uh, World Bank policy. Eric, Eric, Can't you've got bank. a very sketchy background there, mate. Can you get a quiet background and then come back in? Um, <clears throat> our friend uh, Mark Mangiarati um, asks, uh, you know, and it kind of makes me wonder, Michael, like how you've been to the Pentagon, you've been, you know, in these inner circles. No, for I've so never long. been to the Pentagon. <laughs> I've never been to the they Pentagon. They just bought all your books? Well, I've, I've been to a lot of the War College, I've been to all the, uh, uh, the special military think tanks, but I've never uh, had any reason to be in the Pentagon or the CIA or any of these things. Uh, uh, the White House, Congress, not the Pentagon. But I've met a lot okay, of generals. The generals great. would usually come to the Hudson Institute or they'd come, to, I, I'd, I'd have dinner with them somewhere else, never in the Pentagon. Okay. How far in advance do these, you know, the, the forward thinkers um, work? Mark's question sort of hints, um, was the 71 move off gold at all um, self-conscious or was it just a, a lucky stumble that the US dollar became the world's global currency? Um, and would they have already been planning um, this BRICS um, breakup? that's that's going on now and planning for the the next step down the line maybe with blockchain you know it, it, or is it just a, a stumbling mess uh, uh you're not allowed to think about that if you think about problems like uh going on uh, the ending of uh gold uh or the bricks uh, uh somehow other countries uh doing well while you're not doing well uh then your boss is going to say why do you want that to happen why, why do you want? Why do you want to look at our power going down? You must want that to happen. You're not allowed to have any uh, uh, to think. Uh, that's crime think. That's uh, thinking a thought that uh, is going Shut to come on. people come Shut to us. Don't, don't give me that rubbish. They're thinking way in front of you know. They, they were talking about climate being a, a, you know a greater risk than terrorism eight ten years ago. The Pentagon surely they're they're worried about what's coming up with the new global um, fracture? I'm, I'd like to say yes, but uh, I wrote a book called Global Fracture in uh, 1978. Uh, and I based that on uh, basically the speeches that I'd given uh, through the Hudson Institute to uh, uh, when we went around uh, the world uh, meeting with foreign government uh, uh, leaders. And at that time, other governments were looking at uh, what's going to happen uh, without uh, without the uh, dollar. I'll give you an example. Uh, on one occasion, Herman Kahn and I, and, uh, uh, our, uh, the head of our Asia department, uh, had dinner with the uh, president and uh, uh, chief officers of Nippon Steel uh, in Tokyo. And uh, it was a, I basically talked about uh, the future of the dollar and where I thought uh, the exchange rate was going. And it was very nice. Uh, and then the president of Nippon Steel, who almost looked like a Zen master, he looked like such a peaceful, calm face. Uh, he said, let's all sing a song like we do in Japan about uh, 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 that, you know, uh, we learned from childhood. Well, uh, the only, my, uh, you know, uh, other people uh, sang a song and uh, he said, well, what was the first song you, uh, you know, you learned? Uh, uh, Mr. Hudson and I, I, I remembered it. I remember my mother oh, uh, over the ironing board singing a working men unite. We must put up a fight to make us free from slavery and capitalistic tyranny. And all of a sudden this beneficent man sort of hardened and all next to him, there was uh, another Japanese, the uh, number two man at Nippon Steel. And he'd been sort of glowering to the whole male, very spherical head. He looked like uh, uh, a Kurosawa movie villain. And all of a sudden his face broke out in a blissful smile. And uh, he later he took me aside and said, I'm the number two man. And uh, uh, my job is uh, in case uh, we break from the United States and go with China, uh, I'm uh, pursuing that uh, end. 
So I can certainly see, and this was like 1975, 1976. So I can certainly see uh, that other governments uh, throughout the world are thinking, uh, who are we going to go with? Are we going to want to uh, stay with uh, the US and the IMF and the World Bank uh, and all of a sudden have to sacrifice our countries like Germany and Europe are having to sacrifice themselves uh, uh, to fight America's war? Or do we want to go with uh, where the world is actually growing? In China, uh, Russia, uh, India, uh, Eurasia. And uh, they are making plans and it will be like a uh, once a, a click. You can see Turkey, for instance, caught in the middle right now. You can just imagine Erdogan uh, looking ahead. Uh, all of these are looking ahead. But uh, you, if you uh, read what uh, Ray McGovern and other former CIA analysts uh, are talking about uh, in their weekly reports, they say you're not, a, if you, you're not allowed to have thoughts along those lines in the State Department. For instance, in the State Department, uh, uh, they had a, uh, an Arab desk. And uh, one of the first questions uh, they asked one uh, applicant is, uh, well, do you speak Arabic? And uh, the person said, oh, yes, you know, I've, I've learned Arabic in school. And uh, this, the uh, State Department uh, person said, oh, that's really too bad. Uh, we don't, uh, why would anybody want to learn Arabic? I'm sorry, we can't hire you. Well, how can you think ahead? If you, how can you know, uh, uh, I won't say know thy enemy, how can you know the other side uh, if you don't even, uh, uh, aren't able to follow the language. Uh, you, you all have to uh, think together and uh, then you end up like George Tenet at the CIA, just uh, uh, telling uh, President Bush, well, what do you want us to find? And uh, you know that uh, everybody has to uh, get in line with that. They really can't think ahead. And when you get people that pretend to think ahead, like uh, Brzezinski, uh, look at what happens. Uh, uh, the, uh, it, it's as if the Amer the the only people who Americans hire that think ahead have to be born, born in Central Europe. Uh, you have to be like Kissinger. You have to be like Brzezinski. You have to have uh, be born with a hatred of Russia uh, and an absolute desire uh, to uh, fight Russia and uh, uh, China as uh, uh, the enemy. And uh, you, you have to have a tunnel vision. It's sort of like uh, being an economist. Uh, you're not allowed to ask questions about how the economy really works and why is it getting uh, unequal. Uh, you have to get right online saying everything's in equilibrium. Uh, it's really, uh, it, this, there's, there is no alternative. Well, that's how uh, the foreign policy uh, group is in America. There is no alternative. And if you think there is, then it must be because you want to see an alternative and you really don't belong here. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> don't you, Carol? <laughs> uh, I just hear these stories and I, and I hear you mentioned um, dinner with the generals before, and I kind of wish that we could have a Patreon dinner somehow, or, or maybe a martini session with you and hear some of these um, stories. I mean, what are some of the dinners you've been to where you've had revelations given that you really thought and would, wouldn't be revealed? When I, uh, Herman Khan, me, Khan took me to uh, the leading general in Vietnam who had uh, designed the pacification program. And he said, Michael, I know you're uh, an opponent of the Vietnam War. You have to be polite to the person, uh, 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 but I want you uh, to meet with him. Went and had dinner. And I heard the most radical anti-war pacifist speech that I had ever heard. The general said, we can't possibly win. All we can do is kill the Vietnamese. And we think that if we kill them enough, uh, they will say, OK, we give up. We'll do whatever you say. Whereas actually, when you drop napalm on them, they end up doing exactly the opposite of what you want them to do. And now uh, he explained exactly, point by point, militarily, why America could not possibly win in Vietnam. And I was just amazed. And it, it wasn't the general, it wasn't uh, uh, the intelligent generals uh, that were doing well. And we had, uh, Bill Odom was a good general, a part of Hudson Institute there. Uh, it was the civilian, uh, the State Department and uh, the neocons. Uh, that were pressing for war, not uh, really the generals. Well, of course, the neocons now uh, can pick out their own generals like Petraeus and uh, uh, the other, the current uh, head. But uh, uh, certainly back in the 70s, uh, there were generals that uh, absolutely uh, saw 
that uh, this was uh, a disaster. Wow, Jay, I wish I knew. I wish I had a good follow up question for that because I'm sure there's one to delve into that story. Um, but that's phenomenal. I, I, can't, have a, I of... can't have a martini with you because I, I have gout somehow. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I'm on medication now. They say I have to cut back on sugar and alcohol. And so I can't have my daily margarita or, or wine uh, until the gout goes down. So here I am, uh, a cripple. Well, I hope it doesn't affect your uh, writing, your prolific writing. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. We, um, I'm going to let Eric um, come on board again. And oh, no, sorry, it was Carl had another one. Go ahead, Carl. Okay. In my uh, research over the last, well, let's go ahead and go back to December when Russia gave us proposals for uh, security and they, they got the non response response. Uh, what appears to be going on is that we have two camps forming in the world. You have the multipolar world, then you have this unipolar world where the United States is, uh, it has itself and then all of its colonies. And that would be uh, the European Union, uh, New Zealand, Japan, and Australia. Of course, the, uh, England, England is not part of the EU anymore. Uh, so uh, I see this uh, going in, in that direction to the point where we have uh, something similar to uh, the Cold War, except it's different. Uh, Pepe Escobar calls it the tin curtain. I don't know if it's tin. Uh, Billy Joel called it the nylon curtain. Well, uh, maybe it's not a curtain at all, but... Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that there's uh, a possibility for Europe to uncolonize itself, or do you think that they're too far down the road and uh, uh, essentially a hopeless cause, much like the United States is? Well, what the trick question there is, what is Europe? Uh, when most people think of Europe, you think of uh, uh, Germans and French and uh, Englishmen, you think of people. Uh, and certainly the people uh, uh, want a uh, unified world, but uh, Europe that uh, in politics really is, uh, is NATO. Uh, Europe are the politicians and European politics are subordinate to, to NATO. So uh, no matter what the domestic population uh, votes for, uh, the, uh, the foreign policy is basically run uh, by the NATO representatives that are uh, uh, chosen by the United States. Uh, and as for the political representatives, well, uh, the United States uh, taps the phone, as we know, of uh, not only Angela Merkel, but just about all uh, politicians in Europe. And uh, it does uh, an enormous amount of meddling uh, in domestic politics to make sure that uh, uh, someone like Tony Blair uh, or Gordon Brown and end up uh, in control of the Labor Party, or now Ken Starmer, and not uh, an alternative. They make sure that the socialist parties of almost every country uh, in Europe are neoliberals, uh, whose main personal loyalty is to the United States, and maybe a little bit of the uh, uh, consulting fees and uh, income and uh, little white envelopes uh, uh, that uh, uh, the United States manages to uh, get to control uh, what uh, the European politicians say. So Europe turns out to be a pretty corrupt uh, uh, political system subordinate to uh, uh, NATO uh, decisions. So I don't see uh, Europe is uh, being more than uh, a victim until finally things get so bad, uh, but I don't see what an alternative is. I don't see any, uh, 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 you have only the right-wing parties in Europe wanting to uh, uh, be non-aligned with the United States. You have the right wing in France, you have the, uh, the right wing in Germany, and uh, I guess other countries too. Uh, the left wing uh, is uh, just totally uh, pro-US so, uh, and neoliberal. So I just don't see uh, Europe being more than a victim uh, in all this for uh, uh, the next few years. Wow. Okay, um, 
Uh, Eric uh, tried to come online before having some hardware problems. He asked a very interesting question based on a comment you made on naked capitalism, Michael, um, about being invited by representatives from developing countries to discuss an organised debt default by, by these nations. Um, the prospect of a coordinated default on odious debt by the Global South seems to be to, to be very promising, says Eric. This would prevent the West from being able to pick off debtor countries one by one, like Argentina, Turkey, et cetera. Have there been any more discussions since and uh, that you've been privy to? Uh, not with me, but uh, th this goes back to the very first question you asked uh, here uh, about Russian, uh, what's Russia is going, uh, going to do with its foreign exchange. Uh, here's the problem. Uh, suppose you have a Russian bank and it creates uh, this credit and uh, uh, it, extend, uh, it exports its uh, uh, enormous grain uh, potential uh, to, Latin, to Brazil, Argentina, uh, the BRICS, uh, other countries. Uh, the, and then what, uh, what is going to be happening simultaneously is uh, what will uh, Brazil and Argentina do with this? Well, uh, they're going to have to pay much higher uh, dollar uh, debt for their enormous uh, foreign debt that they've uh, taken on as a re uh, from the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, Russia does not want to create credit simply to uh, enable the uh, third world to, or the global south to uh, buy their exports and then uh, for a lower price so that they can pay uh, US dollar bondholders and uh, uh, and, and banks. So uh, there's going to have to be a, a uh, actual split in the world. Countries are going to have to decide which group do you want to belong to, uh, the Eurasian group or the NATO group. And uh, this, the, uh, I think they're trying to work this out right now, and I don't think they've uh, figured out uh, how to do that uh, quite yet. Uh, that's, uh, I talk about this alignment basically uh, in uh, my book on the destiny of civilization, because my uh, all of my training uh, in the '60s was is a balance of payments analyst, and that's how I've I've always looked at the world for in terms of foreign currency. Uh, that that's the one technical specialty uh, that I worked on uh, for many years, and so uh, it, this is usually. It's not a topic that taught in universities uh, is a technical topic. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not really taught anywhere. Uh, I had to learn it by going back and forth to Washington to work with the statisticians, uh, to work at Chase Manhattan for many years, and then Arthur Anderson. Uh, and there's almost no, uh, no technical discussion going on. And uh, I have no idea what the governments of uh, Russia, China, uh, or India are actually doing. Uh, all I can do is sort of read uh, of what I see uh, coming, uh, coming out of them and figure out, well, there's a certain logic to the situation and I'm trying to spell out what the logic is. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, with Russia defaulting on uh, their debt this week, uh, it's a, Tim uh, asked an interesting question about the Russian central bank not, not being in a hurry to reduce interest rates there, citing structural adjustments ahead that will take over two, two and a half years. So yeah, I was surprised by that too. Um, uh, and also sticking to their floating exchange rate. Are they still stuck in neoliberal um, policies in Russia? Well, you don't want uh, uh, floating exchange rates in principle because uh, they can be manipulated by uh, speculators. Uh, th uh, that's what, how uh, George Soros made his money, by uh, uh, essentially betting against the Bank of England that it couldn't hold the exchange rate steadily and it forced uh, the pound to devalue by raising more money than uh, England was willing uh, uh, to print. So uh, you, don't want, uh, you don't want flexible exchange rates to become uh, simply an arena for uh, speculators uh, to pay. You want some form of stability uh, that's why Russia has always preferred long-term contracts uh, with oil and gas. Fortunately, nobody took them up on this. And uh, the Europeans say, we would rather pay five times as much on the spot market because we don't believe in, in long-term uh, exchange rates. That's socialism. We want, uh, we, we, we're neoliberals. We want everything to be the, the market. So we'll pay you three and 4% and we'll drive most of our economy into a depression because that's our philosophy. 
Yeah, but, but what about Russia's actual economic policies? I mean, there's so much cronyism there. Um, is that the extent of their neoliberal um, devotion? Uh, is there any sort of sign that they're actually trying to work a comparative advantage up by using um, the, the, the sort of tax policies that we discuss? Well, the problem in Russia really is they've never heard of Karl Marx. There's no Marxism in Russia. Uh, all they, re they really just uh, listen to American neoliberals that they uh, built in, and they really have, are trying to uh, redevelop in economics without reading any of the classical economists, without reading Marx, without reading Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill or, or any of them. They're trying to uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, and as you point out, of course, they're cronyisms because they're, uh, uh, Put, uh, Putin wants people he can trust. Uh, certainly the old uh, kleptocrats do not have the power that they had under Yeltsin. Uh, but I can't figure out uh, really how much of a discussion uh, is really going on there. Mm. I've yep. not seen their discussion. I've, I've written articles, uh, uh, co-written them uh, for the Valdai Club, but I've never been invited. Uh, 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 to meet Putin. I've been invited to meet Medvedev when he was president, but uh, uh, not Putin. And so I really don't know these people. You're talking about the global fracture before, you know, these new trading blocks opening up. Is that really going to be, you know, I can see politically that happening, but um, typically on from an economic front, the um, sticky transaction costs seem to have disappeared in this day and age of electronic currency. So it should be easier for countries to flick between um, different currency trading uh, regimes. Uh, do you think that's going to sort of, undermine this theory of yours that there's going to be this black and white future? No, if you have two different currencies, it's like a horse race. You can always bet, uh, you, for instance, uh, uh, if oil prices will go uh, down relative to copper prices. Well, if the new uh, 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 multipolar currency uh, will go against the dollar, yet, but you'll be an outside observer. You'll be placing your bets just like you're in a casino uh, or uh, you're betting on which candidate is going to win uh, in an election uh, by the Irish uh, odds makers. Uh, so uh, you can certainly do that. The question is, uh, countries are going to need capital controls. Uh, and uh, I believe that if you're uh, the alternative to uh, the uh, unipolar US uh, order is, of course, the, uh, the BRICS uh, uh, currencies will need capital controls. So they can't get, uh, they want to prevent capital flight. They want to prevent uh, fraud. They want to prevent speculate, spec speculative waves uh, coming in and out. Uh, so capital controls are going to be uh, a key element. And you could even have uh, what you had when I went to work uh, in the 60s, uh, analyzing uh, Latin America's balance of payments. You had two current two exchange rates, one for exports and imports and the other for capital movements. All the countries had that before, uh, a dual exchange rate. Uh, you can very simply see that there. Uh, it, uh, if you haven't gone through this period where everything was really in flux and you can see how the world came to be the way it is today, you look at the world as being somehow there is no alternative. This is just how nature has evolved. Well, it's not how things had to be at all. There are many, many alternatives. And uh, most people are too young to have lived in a world that, in fact, did have alternatives. Mm. Mm. Yeah, finally, we could study economic history at school. Um, no, no, that, that's out of the economic curriculum. That's called yeah. li uh, li literature. Uh, you, you have to go into the humanities literature. Uh, yeah. Um, Carl Sanchez reminds us uh, for Russia that Putin's political economy is based on the economics of abundance, quite similar to China's socialism. I'm not a, uh, the Economics of Abundance was a book by Simon Patton. Uh, that's right. Uh, right. But so in, in, you'd have to tell me how, uh, what Putin means by that. What, he, what is happening in Russia is that he's using the state as a financial mechanism for the whole economy. Of course. Yes, the abundance, the abundance of oil, the abundance of uh, hydrocarbon profits are being plowed back into the economy to go ahead and build up the social network for all the people in the country. That's the goal is to go ahead and make the country as best as it can possibly be for all the people in the country. That's what the economics of abundance was all about. 
was to go well, ahead and try and get uh, enough of everything so that everybody could benefit and profit from it. That was the philosophy of industrial capitalism. And uh, Simon Patton was uh, the first economics professor at the uh, Wharton School and was a protectionist. Uh, so part of the uh, economy of abundance was to protect domestic industry by uh, import tariffs so that you could uh, companies could make enough to afford to invest in the factories and plant and equipment needed to uh, produce uh, manufacturing goods so that they would not have to depend on England uh, and uh, the monopolies that uh, England and English finance uh, supported. Right. And instead of having tariffs, you have sanctions to go ahead and take the place of tariffs. That was a gift to Russia. That's the irony of all this. The United States keeps trying to hurt Russia by uh, imposing uh, sanctions. And as I think we've discussed before here, uh, one of the first sanctions was on uh, agriculture. He thought he could starve them out. And uh, uh, all, uh, so Russia um, uh, uh, became uh, the, the world's largest agricultural exporter. Uh, instead of importing cheese from uh, Lithuania, as I think I've mentioned that before, they developed their own cheese industry. Uh, uh, near Moscow, uh, uh, the sanctions have forced Russia to become self-reliant. When Russia uh, didn't uh, uh, was still too neoliberal to uh, go so far as to raise its own protective tariffs to develop its own industry, <laughs> so America's done it for them. Yes, that's the that's the great irony of it all is that America has uh, forced uh, Russia to redevelop its own political economy for its own benefit and, and seeing that it can't rely on its erstwhile partners to uh, help it in that regime. So yeah. it, it has its uh, arrangement with China and then with all the other uh, uh, organizations that are going now with the EAU, the STO, the CSTO, and, all, and so on and so forth. It's really rather amazing. Yep. That shows you how that Americans really are not very good at looking at the future. They have a, they look at the future with a tunnel vision. They look at a future not realizing that uh, there are many, many possible futures. They look at the future assuming there's no alternative to what uh, America wants. Is uh, I think the neocons say, we make our own reality. So why do you have to anticipate how the rest of the world will evolve if you can make the reality uh, of the world? This is uh, hubris. This, uh, this is not really thinking about the future. This is just uh, saying, how can I beat up other people if they don't fight back? And I'm not even going to think how they might fight back. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. and it's, that's up for, that's the amount of time we have for today, <laughs> looks like. <laughs> right. Well, we'll go, we'll go for another 10 minutes, Michael, if you're all right with that. Because um, I wanted to get back, I want to get back to Robert Hall's um, point earlier on the Chinese Belt and Road program, and he he answered your 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 ridicule, Michael, by saying, "Look, the Chinese are spending so many dollars because uh, they're using the Belt and Road to de-dollarize." Is that happening? Can you see that happening? Um, uh, through uh, the Chinese and even the Japanese. What are the Japanese up to with their dollar stashes? Uh, the Japanese have uh, very low interest rates. Uh, uh, and the result is that uh, the, the Japanese banks and investors are moving their, uh, their borrowing uh, low interest uh, yen, uh, yen in order to buy high interest uh, US treasury bills. And so the Japanese yen is plunging uh, against the dollar. That's going to increase uh, prices of imports for uh, the Japanese. Uh, they're really not, uh, uh, may, uh, not doing very well at all. Uh, I think Japan is a very badly mismanaged uh, economy. Uh, uh, so I can't say much about that. Uh, the Chinese uh, uh, de-dollarizing has nothing to do with the Belt and Road. Uh, they're really, uh, the only thing that China, that the Belt and Road has to do with imports is if you have to import concrete and, and uh, steel uh, in order to uh, make the infrastructure, uh, there's some uh, uh, foreign exchange cost, but uh, China already has uh, so much foreign exchange reserves uh, and export uh, income that uh, it's already trying to minimize its holding of dollars because it, it looked at what the United States did to Russia. And uh, every single uh, week you have Biden saying, remember our real enemy is the yellow peril. Uh, it's not Russia, it's the yellow peril. 
Uh, so China hears that and uh, uh, realizes, well, we'd better uh, minimize our exposure so that uh, uh, America and Europe don't just grab all, all, of, all of our money. So America is trying to speed the parting gift uh, out of the dollar uh, and uh, out of the euro. And uh, what China is doing is very much like Russia. It's, uh, uh, it, it, the Eurasian area is self-sufficient. Uh, it really doesn't need uh, uh, the, the NATO part of the world. It doesn't need the US NATO area. It's, uh, it's self-sufficient. And because the United States uh, uh, and Europe said, let's uh, really win the class war against labor. Let's not hire, let's create uh, unemployment here. Let's just not hire it. Let's uh, make wages go down and we'll hire foreign labor. Uh, and we'll do all of our manufacturing uh, in Asia. Well, okay, America's done it, and uh, uh, Asia can say, well, thank you for helping us develop our uh, industrial uh, uh, capacity and agriculture. Now we don't need you anymore. And uh, America's left uh, deindustrialized. There's no way that the United States can reindustrialize without absolutely transforming uh, itself. Uh, and it's not about to do that. It's a, 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 it can only build new infrastructure uh, and new industry by monopolies. That's what uh, Biden has said. Uh, uh, the government's role is to give free, free profits and monopoly rents to our campaign contributors. That's, uh, he said, that's the Democratic Party and that's uh, uh, what we've always uh, stood for. Uh, and, uh, and we want to keep wages down. That's why I reappointed the Republican uh, head of the Federal Reserve, you know, to make sure that uh, we, uh, we push a depression just to prevent wages from going up so that our, uh, one, our corporations, the 1%, our, our donor class uh, can make more money. Well, I don't see it happening. So you'll, you'll have Asia self-sufficient, really not needing much foreign exchange at all. Uh, the the uh, BRICS Bank, can uh, do most of the funding uh, internally. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, North America and Europe will become largely irrelevant. All they can do is drop bombs. There is nothing they can do. All they can do is uh, try to bomb people. And uh, that obviously is not working. Michael, uh, Jake Daniels asked a few good questions in the Q&A. Um, come on in, uh, Jake. Uh, what, what would you like to ask? OK, thank you. Um so uh, I have, a, yeah, I do have, and I don't want to get greedy. So I'll, I was um, going to ask one that's short and sweet, hopefully, which is um, like, uh, I'm interested in New Zealand because uh, I'm, I'm moving there soon. And they've just announced free trade ag agreements with the UK, EU. And then, uh, and before that, the ones that I was more like happy to see them uh, announcing were like up updates to uh, free trade agreements with Sing Singapore and China. So I'm wondering, I know you uh, don't have much um, knowledge about New Zealand, but do you think that these sort of moves are in their New Zealand's interests as far as like just um, being an island nation and, um, and therefore dependent on trade, but, um, and also do you see any conflicts that could be stemming from these uh, free trade agreements that are now like opposing blocks or emerging opposing blocks? I don't think they said free trade at all. I think they say fair trade. Fair trade means we win, you lose. That's our idea of fair. Uh, there, uh, America uh, has very heavy tariffs uh, to block, uh, to block uh, aluminum imports, to block uh, uh, steel. Uh, America is, has, is the most protectionist agricultural economy in the world. Uh, there's no way that America really is going to uh, go for free trade. It's doing just the opposite. Uh, in, uh, in uh, voluntary export uh, constraints. My global fracture was all about uh, how the whole menu of, uh, uh, interfer of blockages that America says, well, we'll have free trade, but you have to uh, have a, a voluntary uh, self-restraint on how much you're going to uh, export to the United States of so steel, of cars. Uh, uh, it's all, uh, it's really uh, centrally planned, dictated, Ship. So for America, free trade is uh, America gets to uh, centrally plan uh, the prices that uh, other countries will charge uh, and what they will uh, buy from the United States. It has nothing to do with uh, what uh, economists used to call free trade. Jake, I know you've got another one. We'll go to you and then um, uh, Ben to finish off. 
Okay, cool. Um, then, uh, I mean, in, in uh, super imperialism, and again, here in Destiny of Civilization that I'm in the middle of reading, you know, land tenure is just a huge part of your um, analysis, and um, particularly the lack of its reform in, in the post-war context, for particularly for the global south. But um, so I'm just wondering if there's, uh, if you could riff on how, what an ideal reform would look like, and, it, and how that would be different in the underdeveloped or global South uh, that's been, you know, subject to the Washington consensus versus maybe something in the U.S. or European context, although it, it didn't sound like you think there's much chance of that anyway, but. Well, back in the 1950s and 60s, the United Nations had a number of uh, wonderful reports on land reform, and uh, there was a World Bank for Economic Acceleration. Uh, designed uh, by uh, my mentor, Terence McCarthy, and promoted by uh, uh, the, uh, it, it was uh, uh, promoted before Congress, uh, the Rockefellers uh, fought against it. Uh, copies of the World Bank for Economic Acceleration by uh, Morris Forgash uh, was a uh, Florida senator uh, who had uh, uh, put the bank before the proposal before Congress. Uh, Rockefeller said, every country that has land reform is against America. And uh, we need to control the food supply. So if they do something we don't want, we can starve them. If we can't kill them at our will, uh, that's a threat to our, our survival. We are, we are not safe unless we can decide to starve people into obeying us. Uh, and uh, the result was that the State Department immediately followed the, the policy of assassinating every leader of land reform that they could in Latin America. Uh, you can look at the 1953-54 Guatemala uh, situation. The United States came out and said, land reform is uh, the enemy of the United States. It threatens uh, our uh, agriculture, and uh, uh, we, uh, we, want, uh, uh, to we want the land uh, to be uh, reorganized into latifundia. We want huge estates that will not grow food, but will grow tropical export crops. And this was uh, the epoch of uh, United Fruit uh, in, in Guatemala and other countries. Uh, a land reform would have, uh, uh, would basically, uh, that's what the fight in Brazil is now, for indigenous tribes growing their own food. It's for regions and for countries to be self-sufficient in food with uh, farms. Uh, in order to have uh, family farming working, you need uh, an enormous domestic currency uh, expenditure. You need roads. You, uh, the American agriculture uh, is a model of how to, uh, how to create food self-sufficiency. Uh, uh, there are agricultural extension services, uh, education services, there's uh, seed, uh, seed studies, you provide the farmers with seeds, uh, you provide uh, inexpensive uh, public uh, uh, transportation so that the farmers will be free of the monopolies uh, that they're in today. Uh, you have government marketing uh, boards that can uh, assure fair prices and uh, uh, reduce the dependency on local petty monopolies uh, yeah, essentially, other countries should emulate what the United States did in the 1930s. A and at that time, in the 30s and 40s, the rise in American agricultural productivity was higher than any productivity gain in any industry in the world. Uh, productivity really came from agriculture. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, uh, the World Bank uh, decided its great uh, its, its task was to prevent uh, land reform. Uh, and to prevent uh, food uh, self-sufficiency uh, very explicitly. And that, uh, to me, uh, that is uh, one of the main reasons that countries should have nothing to do with the World Bank or the IMF and uh, why they can claim that the debt that they owe to the World Bank and IMF is odious debt uh, that was forced on them uh, by, uh, by United States interference and uh, has uh, just, if anything, the United States owes these countries reparations, which of course it will never pay. Wow, what an answer. Thanks, Michael. Uh, ben, can you top off a, a question uh, like that one? Um, I'll, I'll try, but okay. So it seems to me that this current conflict in Ukraine um, is the United States wanting to weaken Russia, uh, which begs the question, why? And they've come out and said, essentially, it's to try to eventually choke off China from energy and natural resources. And so I see this as sort of a... a um, 
a life and death struggle for both Russia and China. But it seems to me also that from their actions, they these two countries haven't really taken it as seriously um, as that. Um, you know, for me, like I see the U.S. has continued to escalate with no signs of stopping. Um, and and so I, I see a lot of danger here. Um, and I'm just curious if there's something I'm still missing because Russia, you know, it's it's um, it's still sending gas. Right. It's it, basically Russia and China are still funding the United States in its um, economy and, and war effort and getting uh, paper promises in return. Um, it, it just, it, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just still very confused by this, this uh, point. Well, it's not a life and death struggle because uh, China and Russia have already said they won't lose. Uh, when somebody asked Putin about a month ago, well, what if there's atomic war? Would you use a time? Uh, if they really begin to, if NATO really uh, uh, attacks you via Ukraine, uh, will you use atomic Russian weapons? And Putin said, who would want to live in a world without Russia? Well, <laughs> that was a pretty uh, eloquent answer. So uh, obviously, uh, uh, there's no way that Russia uh, can lose in a, a life and death struggle, except by blowing up uh, the whole world. So I just don't, and the United States, uh, 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 apart from uh, uh, Biden's uh, uh, Secretary of State and uh, Jake Sullivan, I don't think they want to blow up the world. Well, do you think that That'd be an, you know, because under Obama, we uh, improved, I guess, or we refreshed the nuclear weapons arsenal by about a trillion dollars. My, my worry is that somebody in the White House thinks that a nuclear war is winnable with Russia. And um, that's how we got this conflict in the first place. Well, that's the danger. Uh, and these people, uh, I, I've met the national security types when I was uh, at the Hudson Institute for many years. And they're crazy. They, they are filled with hatred uh, of the stories that they grew up about their family suffering in the Holocaust. And uh, they look at the whole rest of the world as being uh, potential enemies that somehow want to put them in the gas chambers. And these are, uh, are twisted uh, people. And indeed, uh, this is why people are afraid of the deep state in the United States. Uh, they're, they're nuts. Uh, I don't think that other countries are nuts. Uh, but uh, if they think the nuts are going to make a preemptive strike on Russia, uh, well, you don't know what they're going to do. And then uh, certainly the, uh, when everybody is afraid of nuts on the other side, uh, all you can do is have, uh, let's say a full moon comes over the horizon and somebody thinks it's uh, uh, a Luftwaffe about to uh, bomb them. Well, you can have uh, uh, an atomic war breakout. So yes, that's the whole danger of all of this. This is why I think Europe is so crazy because I think that there's sort of a tacit agreement uh, between Russia uh, and the United States uh, saying, well, look, if we really have to use atomic war, let's fight it in Europe. Let's make sure that, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's fought to the last European, we won't bomb each other. And maybe China and the United States says, well, you know, if there's a fight, you know, let's really not bomb each other. Let's fight over Japan to the last Japanese. I can, I, I'm sure there's something like that kind of a tacit agreement. Wow. Okay, we're going to um, get towards wrapping up, but I've got to ask this question from Mark. Uh, is Biden a fall guy? Is Biden a fall guy? A fall guy? No, he's, uh, he's just uh, a front man. I mean, a fall guy, uh, he was put in as a front man. Uh, somebody who just... Uh, 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 the, the policy is really being made by the deep state. You already saw un, uh, under Donald Trump, where uh, he wanted to uh, withdraw from uh, Syria and uh, Afghanistan, and the general just didn't do it. They didn't pay any attention to him. Uh, if, if Biden did have an idea, which I don't think he does, uh, the, uh, the State Department and the Pentagon simply would, uh, would ignore it. So he's not a fall guy. He, I mean, they, uh, his, he was just put in uh, to prevent Bernie Sanders from coming in. But the fact is, if Bernie Sanders had been president, there was nothing Bernie could do that uh, Biden uh, 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 hasn't done. Because uh, he, uh, the president, it's not a monarchy here. You're dependent on Congress and uh, the Senate uh, to really 
uh, do any policy. And all Bernie Sanders could have done would have been to appoint a different Secretary of State, a different Secretary of Defense, but still uh, he wouldn't have any more control than, than, uh, uh, than, than Trump did. And uh, Biden is really just sort of a, a, a front man. He's, uh, that's what politicians are. They, are. they are sponsored by their donors to do what the donor class wants them to do. And Biden's donors, like the Republicans, are Wall Street. That's the same donors who give to both parties. So basically, they follow what uh, the finance, insurance, and real estate sector want done. Mm. They should all wear uniforms that have logos um, that represent the size of their donations. Um, Michael, um, it's been fantastic talking with our Patreons here. You know, we're, we're uh, you know, six months into this, we've finally got a good webinar platform. Uh, thanks so much to the Real Progressives for giving us that. Um, you know, Michael, what are what are the these payments doing to make your life easier? What is what sort of message do you want to say to the the supporters? Uh, it, it not that it. it it's nice to know that people are actually paying attention uh, to what I'm doing and engaging in these conversations. Uh, the whole idea is uh, you want to talk about uh, the things that uh, I'm tr trying to talk about. And what I'm trying to do is spread a way of looking at the world uh, in terms of uh, the dynamics at work. And the more you can spread these dynamics and the more of these discussions we can have, uh, uh, the better it is. So uh, it, it's nice to know that uh, there are people uh, outside of China uh, that actually care about what I'm uh, writing about. Beautiful. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for your time. Gee, a lot of amazing questions. Um, really good, the diversity of um, tangents we took there. And um, we'll look forward to um, getting getting this online sometime soon. But uh, Michael, um, uh, you mentioned you've got a few new books coming up. Is there any actual research coming up that you're doing? Well, I'm, uh, my book on the collapse of antiquity, a history of uh, uh, Rome, uh, Rome's creditor and landowning class uh, is just being uh, uh, proofread now and uh, 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 typeset. And after that, uh, all of my collected essays about the Bronze Age and where Western civilization went wrong, uh, essentially with classical antiquity, uh, to be uh, the first civilization that didn't regularly cancel the debts. Uh, that'll be out at the end of the year. I finished it at all, all, but I have to wait for the proofreader and the typesetter to uh, get around uh, setting these. So I have both of those uh, books that'll be out by the end of the year. Beautiful. All right. Well, thanks, Michael. Um, great that, you know, we have this interface through Patreon. So thanks everyone for your time today. Um, yeah, that'll uh, about do us. So um, we'll look forward to being with you um, in September.